today's speaker is a gentleman named David Perry. And as CEO and founder of David Perry and Associates, David's specialties include community and government affairs, social media, so public media relations, and crisis communications. Um, I'm sure there are a few of us who've dealt with that issue over the years. David serves on the board of directors for China SF, whose goal is to attract and retain Chinese investment and business expansion into San Francisco and the Bay Area. And to also support San Francisco Bay Area businesses in their business efforts in China. I think I'd like that to get to go to China. I think I'd like that job. Originally from Richmond, Virginia, David began his career with the National Endowment for the Arts, followed by stints as communications director for San Francisco's Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, media manager for the San Francisco Partnership, a public and private venture of the San Francisco Mayor's Office and the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce and edited the national nonprofit magazine, Opportunity Knox. David is a frequent lecturer, travels extensively, and in his spare time, David is a maritime historian and lectures, aboard, lectures about the great age of ocean lines. Of course, he does this aboard ships whenever possible, if he uses that as an excuse to get the, uh, to get the passage. And I was talking to him beforehand and learned a couple of things. Um, and Elizabeth, pay attention to this. He is, uh, he is a confirmed descendant, or maybe not confirmed, of Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry. And you may all know that, uh, does anybody know the famous court by Commodore? We have met the enemy and they are ours. Um, I think we've heard that in some form or another. And, and Elizabeth, it does have something to do with Lake Erie and Ohio. You should know this in the interior, but you're, you're eerily silent over there today. Um, and the other thing he's going to do that I don't have the courage to do or the needs to do at my age anymore is June 1st, uh, he is doing a, uh, a bike ride, a fundraiser for AIDS from here down to LA. And I asked him if he was going to do the hard part, which was the back, uh, the uphill return trip to uh, San Francisco. And he said he wasn't. So, uh, proud to welcome. I really enjoyed meeting him this morning. And so, David, come on out. We're looking forward to you. Thank you very much for having me. I was delighted to hear there was someone from Ohio and Blake Erie. Somebody knows about my, my famous ancestor, Oliver Hazard Perry. You know, um, today we're going to be talking about telling stories. My dad was a great teller of tall tales. He told me when I was growing up that I was indeed descended from Oliver Hazard Perry, Commodore Perry, and his famous brother, Matthew Perry. Of course, I've never had DNA sampling to prove that. So well, that means I can till, still tell the story, honestly. But I did learn that famous phrase, we have met the enemy and they are ours. He was America's first great naval hero, defeated the combined British fleet on Lake Erie, and his brother Matthew opened the Sea of Japan. But we're not here to talk about ships today. You know, my grandmother, who is one of the people we're going to talk about, who is one of my mentors as far as public speaking, always said there were two magic words, please and thank you. And so I want to say, please, at the end of my uh, talk this morning, please ask questions. Please tell me what you think, whether you like it or not, and whether it was helpful. You know, and I'm one of those people who believes that you shouldn't offer advice. You should just tell stories. So if I say something today that's useful to you, please use it. And if it's not useful, please don't tell Kristen because, well, she'll never have me back again and tell everyone that I'm not a very good speaker. When Kristen did invite me, I found it interesting that in the first paragraph of the invitation, she said, I want you to talk about impactful public speaking, including the walk to the podium. You know, in 30 years of this business, I've never had anyone ask me to tell them how to walk to the podium. So I didn't think about that. And what I would say is, if you're going to start a keynote address and you want to be impactful, use the three C's when you walk to the podium, or as hopefully I try to do without spilling my water, bound to the podium with the three C's of commitment, concentration, and confidence. Now this is a keynote speech, uh, 8 a.m. Thank you all for getting up very early for it. I appreciate it. You know, it's called a keynote. It's not called a key symphony or a key opera, which means it should be short. You know, I'm a great believer in that story that there are two things that have never happened in the history of the world. 
No one has ever washed a rented car, and after hearing someone like me speak, no one has ever said, gosh, that speech was too short. So I'm here to tell you that I'm not going to speak for a very long time. I believe in the words of my grandmother's hero, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said the key to successful public speaking were the three B's. Be sincere, be brief, and be seen. You know, what we do as public speakers is tell stories. And I was very honored to lead a breakout session yesterday about successful writing. And I said something that I am going to repeat today, which is it's all about relationships. You all are government affairs people. You relate for a business. You relate to government, you relate on behalf of your clients, you relate to the world at large. And nowadays, in the age of social media, there is no privacy. So you, like me, are paid to talk. And it is all about building relationships. And the way we build relationships is through telling stories. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to tell you a few stories about my life and career that hopefully will illustrate what I believe is impactful public speaking. I get paid to talk. And when I was a little boy, my grandmother said that, that absolutely was going to be my job in life because I was one of those people who talked too much. And she said, son, you know, the good Lord gave you two ears and one mouth, so he must have meant for you to listen twice as much as he meant for you to talk. Well, I never really quite got that lesson, and one of the things she would tell me, listen, 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 stop running backwards. I had this habit as a young boy of running backwards in the backyard. And I would do this at age three or four up until I was five, when one day when I was running backwards, I ran into my grandmother's concrete bird bath. And I hit it smack with my head, instantly broke it in two, fell on my head, knocked me unconscious. I'm told for about three or four minutes. By the time I came to, I was laying there in my grandmother's backyard, with all the neighbors around had a look of concern on my grandmother's face. But as soon as she realized I wasn't dead, she scowled and she said, well, if that doesn't prove you're a hard-headed piece, I don't know what does. <laughs> you know, I grew up in a political family. And we are here in San Francisco with representatives of companies, organizations from all 50 states, I'm sure all all sides of the political spectrum. But I grew up in a time when political dialogue was just that. A dialogue, not a monologue. Having said that, my grandmother was what is referred to in the South as a yellow dog Democrat. Now, what a yellow dog Democrat means, for those of you who aren't from the South, is a Democrat that is so partisan that they will vote for a yellow dog before they voted for a Republican. There were two pictures on my grandmother's wall in Virginia. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Jesus Christ. And I remember my grandmother said, you know, hon, if there's a fire one day, I'm grabbing that picture of FDR. Jesus walked on water. He's going to have to help himself. <laughs> I asked her once why politics and government was important to her. And I'm sure it's the same reason it's important to you. Because it's there to help people. You represent your companies to open a dialogue with the government, local, federal, state. She believed government was there to help people. I asked her once, she was born in 1898. I said, Grandma, when was the first time you voted? She said, son, I voted in the very first election in which women were allowed to vote, and I've never missed one. And I said, Grandma, do you always vote for Democrats? She wouldn't say it. She said, you know, son, when you go in that voting booth, it's private. And she said, I love you, but I'm not telling you who I vote for. She said, I will tell you this, though. If you put a Republican and a Democrat in the same bag and shook it up, I really don't know which one would fall out first. I think that was good advice. That was a time when dialogue, not monologue, was about what government was about. And I believe that is one of the elements of impactful public speaking. We're here to create a dialogue. I'm speaking to you today because you nice folks have asked me here to hopefully give you some tips that you will remember and will help you in your work. But I'm not here to deliver a monologue. I'm here to engage in a dialogue. I am the vehicle through which hopefully you can learn some things. One of the other people I learned a lot from and who helped me in my public speaking life was my mother. My mother worked for a company called CP, 
Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone. It got bought by AT&T in the 70s. I remember her telling me when AT&T decided to uh, you know, break up Ma Bell, she said, son, I'm telling you this is going to be a bad idea. And I have to say that uh, I think over the years, maybe she was right. But twice a year, my mother would disappear. And she was a great communicator. She started out when she was 16 years old as an operator on the switchboard in Richmond, Virginia. She actually was on the switchboard the night of the War of the Worlds broadcast back in 1938. She used to love telling this story. She said she came home because all of a sudden the switchboard lit up and she and her friend, who was also 16, said all these calls started coming in about invasion. Some of them were talking about Mars, but this was right after some things were going on in Germany, which seemed to indicate that war might be coming in the next year. They thought the Germans had invaded. So mother went home, told my grandfather that she was afraid that Germany had invaded just about that time. The next door neighbor came over and said, Martians had invaded. And my mother started to tell the neighbor the truth. And my grandfather put his hand on her arm and said, Sugar, just let him go on for a little while. It's funny. <laughs> it's funny. Humor is also, I believe, an important part of impactful public speaking. You know, they say, some people do, rather, I don't, that you should start every speech with a joke. I don't necessarily start it with a joke, but I do try to get the audience laughing, because there really is no better icebreaker, no better beginning to a successful dialogue than a bit of humor. As I said, my mother went away after she got into seeing the executive class. Every six months for a big job, this was when I was about seven, eight years old, and I'd be very scared because I wouldn't be able to talk to my mother except by phone once every two days. And finally, after my mother died many years later when I was in my teens, I spoke to her boss. And he came over to me at the funeral and he said, did you ever wonder where your mother went every six months for a few years back when you were a young man? I said, I did. He said, she was in a place called Mount Weather in Virginia which some of you know, Mount Weather and Mount Storm, is supposed to be the place in case of a nuclear attack, our government goes to stay in charge, goes to be protected. My mother was one of the people that taught the US government how to survive a nuclear blast. I was always very proud of that. And I remember that my mother must have had a hard time keeping that secret. But I was also very proud to think that my mother was there as the person that could stand in front of the White House staff and teach communication skills. I remember in her drawer after she died, I found a simple piece of paper in her handwriting, which I still keep, and helps me, and I think of, and I repeat, every time, including today, before I step up to speak in public. And that's about 50 or 60 times a year. And on that piece of paper it says, success is a journey not a destination. I also believe that is key to impactful public speaking. It's a journey. And like any good journey, there is a beginning and there is an end. There's a frame. And sometimes you start in the middle of the story. Sometimes you start at the beginning, but you always know where you're going to get. There's a road map. I have my notes in front of me. And like a piece of sheet music, whenever I play piano, I have that sheet music in front of me. But after 40 years of playing piano, I rarely look at it, but I know it's there. So when you get up to speak before a group of people, like I am today in front of you, have your notes, whether you use them or not. Have that frame, and have those stories that illustrate impactful public speaking. You know, I've been talking a lot about the, the women in my life. I was lucky to be raised by my mother and then my grandmother, and a bevy of aunts that would have done the path of designing women's shame. I remember when my, my northern friends from college would say, those, those women don't exist. I'm like, yes, they do. They're the tired women, and they exist in Franklin County, Virginia, and they raised them. And one of the things the tired women did every year, never failed, was sit down in front of the TV, black and white, because my aunt Helen thought the color TV was full of radiation. But get you. We would watch Miss America, especially those two years in the 1960s with Miss Virginia, one Miss America two years in a row. There was a lot of popcorn and bourbon and ginger drank in that night. My, my mother and my father. And I remember one of the first PR jobs I ever had, now 25 years ago, 
was handling the PR tour for Miss America, right here in San Francisco. Well, obviously, I was very excited. My mother had passed away, but my grandmother was alive, and I had to tell you, nothing I ever did excited her more than telling her that I was going to be Miss America. Now, I don't know how many of you all have seen that film, Miss Congeniality, but Miss America is nothing like that character who portrays the ditzy contestant from Rhode Island when the host says to her, describe your perfect date. And she says, that's hard. A perfect date. Well, I guess I'd have to say April 25th. It's not too cold, it's not too hot. You can go out with the lights but This Miss America was nothing like that. This Miss America had a platform. This Miss America was the definition of an impactful public speaker. And she had come to San Francisco with her mission and her crown, her tiara, which is very important to the end of my story, to talk about age awareness. This was in 1990. And of course, 1990 was a year in which AIDS, HIV was headlines everywhere, and especially here in San Francisco, where 10,000 people, 10,000 people in this city died of AIDS, HIV. So it was much more than a social issue. It was a news issue. And a lot of people were talking about it. And I gotta tell you, this was the first Miss America with a crown who ever came to talk about AIDS in San Francisco. And my job was to travel with her around town and set up interviews. And in a box next to her, wherever she went, was something that I later came to find was very important. And the reporter from San Francisco Chronicle finally couldn't take it any longer. He said, what is in that box that you always carry? It looks like the football the president carries with nuclear codes. She said, that's my tiara. He said, oh, go ahead and put it on. And she said, no. He said, oh, no, come on, just for the photo. And she got very silent. She said, my job is to go to public high schools, some of them in the inner city of this country, and talk to 15 and 16-year-olds about safe sex and AIDS and HIV. She said, you know, it's hard enough to get a teenager to talk seriously about sex without listening to a woman with a crown on her head. The only time that Miss America wears her crown, evidently, is when she's crowned and when she hands it to someone else. I just remember that. Miss America was an impactful public speaker because she knew her audience. She wears that crown when everyone wants to see the crown. And that visual helps her deliver her message. When she's talking to 16-year-olds with her hormones raging about safe sex and the dangers of AIDS, she doesn't wear a crown. That's why I'm not speaking with visuals today except my website. Yesterday, I used a keynote presentation, PowerPoint slides. I was teaching a class, and I wanted to get home some messages that my class, my colleagues, would use with them. I believe, and you will have other people tell you differently, that when someone is giving a keynote speech, the emphasis should be on the words. Be brief. Be sincere. Then be seated. Roosevelt was right. As I said yesterday in my class, use the KISS method when you're giving a speech. Keep it short and simple. You know, I believe that some of the most successful public speakers in history, probably with, uh, without a surprise to anyone, are U.S. presidents. The two that I always remember are on different sides of the political spectrum. Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. But you know, a lot of people don't realize this, even though both of them became known for being great communicators, they didn't start that way. Ronald Reagan stuttered. One of the reasons he went into acting was to get over his stuttering problem. He became one of the great communicators of all time. And why was Ronald Reagan a good communicator? Was it because of his policies? I have to say no, because I remember the election of 1980, and as a Democrat, I can tell you, I knew that it wasn't just Republicans who had voted him into office. It was a landslide. What was he saying that made Ronald Reagan an impactful public speaker? It wasn't what he was saying, I believe. It was how he said it. What was the one quality of Ronald Reagan that made him an impactful public speaker? What I believe it was, was optimism. Many of you may remember his famous campaign video, It's Morning in America. Well, for some people it was morning, for some people it wasn't. That could be debated politically. But when you heard Ronald Reagan talk about it, 
you believed. You believed he was optimistic. And what is a leader? A leader is someone who serves you through leading. Leading is not about the top down. It's about lifting people up. And whatever you may say about Ronald Reagan, and again, I'm here, out of the closet as a Democrat, that was a leader. He was an impactful public speaker. He generated optimism. On the other side of the political spectrum is the other president that I believe was and still is an incredibly successful public speaker, and that's Bill Clinton. You know, some people say that Bill Clinton is the reason that Barack Obama got reelected because of that incredible speech he gave at the Democratic Convention. Less people remember that the first time Bill Clinton spoke to a Democratic Convention when Michael Caucus was running for president, he spoke for almost an hour. People left the hall in droves. I'm glad no one's leaving here yet, thank you. And the only applause that Bill Clinton got during that speech was at the end when he said, and now, in closing, and people were through, Bill Clinton learned and took the advice of FDR. Be sincere, be brief, and be seated. But why is Bill Clinton now considered an impactful public speaker? Ronald Reagan generated optimism. I believe Bill Clinton had and still has the uncanny ability to connect with an audience. I've never seen Bill Clinton do a monologue. He does the dialogues. Everywhere he goes, he connects with people. And again, if you follow politics as I do, you know that Bill Clinton didn't just get elected with Democratic votes. He had to inspire people who listened to him and connected with him on something other than a political basis. He connected with people. That's the other thing that I think is very important if you're going to have an impactful public speaking session. Know your audience, connect with your audience, find a way to make them your friends. In my notes before I came up here, before making sure I had a confident, committed, uh, and creative balance to the stage, I had a note that said, don't forget to work the room. That's also important. I always try to arrive at every speech I give about an hour in advance. Not only so I can meet the audience, but so I can meet the technician, Joshua, let's give a round of applause to our AV guy back there. <laughs> Not only do I want to pay tribute to those who work to make our events successful, but in the same way that when I was a waiter paying my way through college, I knew that you had to tip the chef because, boy, you could mess up your order. Um, meet the AV person before you give your speech. It's going to be all about whether you sound good or look good. And if you're up to the AV guy, I promise you, uh, you won't look good or sound good. You know, before I end my remarks, I'm going to teach you something. You know, it is said that 99% of people on the planet are petrified to do what I'm doing now and what I'm here to help you do, get up and speak in public. You know, Jerry Seinfeld once did a wonderful comic routine about how no one wants to speak in public, even people who are given a eulogy. Because anyone giving a eulogy would frankly rather be in the coffin than stand up and talk in public. I think it's true. You know, I have been speaking in public since I was a small boy. I was born on November 1st, 1961, a month early. Because I was premature, my father and my brother were watching a football game, not expecting me to come along. And my mother, a powerful executive woman, walked in great the child and said, Joe, we need to go. To which my father said, can we wait till halftime? To which my mother said, no, we can.